So welcome, this is Kate Lanigan McGregor with Agent Rising Real Estate School, Real Estate Brokerage, Unit 9. Okay, so this is actually one of my favorite chapters. Um, and so hopefully I will try to stay on task for you. <laughs> so anyway, um, how to maximize this unit, I'm just gonna remind you again. Can I have a raised hand on how many people have used their audio? Okay, I feel like giving up. I, didn't I say I was gonna have presents today? I did not have presents today. Tomorrow I'm having, well, Thursday I'm having presents for people who, who answer the question. You guys have all tomorrow. Tomorrow is, say after me, tomorrow is Glossary on My Audio Day. One, two, three. Glossary on My Audio Day. Okay, so you're going to audio yourself on that glossary. All right, and I, and I just want to give you an example of how powerful that audio can be. You know, I uh, had to give this little speech this morning, and I was nervous, and I was stammering, and, and I wrote it, I actually copied a lot of stuff. I did a, another one that I gave a little while ago. But I took each paragraph and I taped myself on like over the weekend while driving, because I do it while driving, over and over again. And then, so when I was nervous today and I was up in front of the people, it almost came automatically because I remembered it. I had that memory. Remember I told you like it gets stored in there somewhere? So, you know, people who, in my car, if there was nobody in the car, but if they were, they'd be like, oh my God, she's ridiculous. You know, uh, except my daughter. She would never say I'm ridiculous. Yes? It came up great for you. Oh, it came up great. Thank you. So smooth. Smooth. So it was smooth. I'm not very smooth normally when I give speeches. So and it was only a short one, but I just um, I wanted to make sure that I had it there. You know what I mean? So I'm going to practice what I preach. If I'm telling you guys to do this, I have to believe it for myself. Okay. So you have your book open to the. So you're going to do it. You're going to follow. Not. You don't need that one. Okay. So the forum. Has anyone gone to the forum yet? Me either. <laughs> okay. So real estate brokerage, within a brokerage, no matter how large or small it is, each real estate professional has an individual business. Okay, so what this means is, and sometimes when I, I talk about this, I talk about it as you inc, meaning like you are in charge of your business, okay? You are an independent contractor, you are in charge, you're your boss, okay? Um, you work for a brokerage, so, you, so as a salesperson, you would work under a broker's license. And that broker, like here, is me. Okay, so there's many brokers in the office that practice under my license. Under my license? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, the people who are going through their broker's license, at some point in time, they, could, they, they, would, they would not have to work under my broker's license. But under bold moves, there's one license. Okay? Under any other company, because even no matter how many brokers there are, they, you, you're, you're under what they call the broker of record. Okay? I hate that word under, but. Uh, okay, so economics and personal decisions are part of running a business. Okay, so what that means is that while you are all independent contractors, you would follow the policies of that brokerage. Okay? And a, sexful, and a successful real estate professional needs to think like a business person. Okay, so I'm going to tell you now part of your success will be waking up in the morning, and I'll say, writing a thank you note or two thank you notes a day, or not even thank you notes, we'll just call them notes. Notes touching out to people, sitting down, figuring out who you're gonna to talk to that day, what you're gonna do for business. So, you're gonna start your business that way every day, okay? So, you know, when you, so you don't judge your, it's not like a job where you punch in and you punch out, okay? Nobody is going to be checking to see if you're here at nine. You know, most people write their notes in their pajamas at home. You know, or they start their prospecting, reaching out on the emails or sending out whatever they're doing when they're home or when they're, there's something. Not too many people come to the office for that period of time. So you're in charge, right? Not too many people are here. You saw, you guys have seen people come in and out all day long, right? So they come in, they have some paperwork, they do this, they do that. Wherever you're doing and wherever you're doing it, it's probably gonna be a very similar situation, okay? Nobody checks that, <coughs> you know? Is this what it did before? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't think your computer can last the 10 hours over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, um, I'm gonna, is, we need to give us right, is Kevin around the corner? Kevin. No, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> go ask him to bring the big computer. <laughs> Will you go give the big computer? <laughs> Please. Oh, that one. Yeah, oh, it's not that big. Oh my god. So I'm gonna get I gotta get a big computer, not use the laptop. Um, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. 
Okay, so we're just gonna have to wait a second. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I think is next. Um, Oh, that's yeah. Two people saw it. I'm just going to change this over here. Ah! I want it right over. I don't want it over here because I can't. Thank you. What do you want? The matter? So Kevin has been the, been the one that's been going through sharpening all of those slides for you to look so beautiful. I'll do a cape while you chit chat. Okay. There you go. That's that. That happens. Okay. And do I have glasses? Yep. Okay. All right. So we're just going to do it by by the book, like everybody's been doing today. Can I borrow this for a little? Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh look, he has a he has a um, comic book inside his book here. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so, <laughs> you guys ever do that? Okay. Tell us? Yes. Uh, no, he's just looking. You know, like, so we're going like this, I'm going, that kid, he's staying the whole time. <laughs> and meanwhile, we got Marvel in here, you know? Just kidding. All right. So, so, so our objectives for this chapter are to describe the fundamentals of the real estate brokerage and licensing laws, describe the pur purpose and basic elements of antitrust laws, including price fixing, boycotts and allocation of markets, explain how real estate professionals should use technology in real estate practice and comply with the laws and ethical standards, and define the following key terms. Okay, so your key terms are going to be for this uh, antitrust laws, boycott, brokerage, commission, disclaimers, electronic contracting, electronic signatures in global and national commerce, or e-signing, employee, independent contractor, internet data exchange policy, managing broker, minimum level of services, multiple <coughs> listing service, national do not call registry, price fixing, procuring cause, ready, willing, and able buyer, and uniform electronic transaction act. Okay, so those are our words that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so those are gonna go when you're doing this chapter and you have your computer or your laptop opened up to the to the slideshow, your book in front of you with this, right, and your audio. What you're going to do is you're going to go through the things, you're going to look them up, and you're going to put them with a chapter or in the unit, I guess they call them for this, okay? Um, okay, so the purpose of real estate licensing laws are to establish basic requirements for obtaining a real estate license, and in most cases require continuing ed to keep a license. Defining which activities require licensing. Describing the acceptable standards of contact, conduct and pra practice for all licensees and enforcing those standards through a disciplinary system. Okay, so what that means to us is that whatever you're dealing with any real estate professional, we're all following the same licensing laws. Okay, we're all following the same um, things that we can talk about, that the procedures that we use, and, and it's all based on protection of our consumers, okay? So it's the consumers with whom um, we deal that we wanna make sure that they have that protection. And again, who here has ever had a bad experience with a real estate agent? <laughs> Ryan's like her. What happened to you, with you? Um, well, just, re just recently I bought a condo and it was a nightmare from day one. I was promised all kinds of things and <coughs> didn't fall, follow through with them. Okay. Um, ended up closing when I shouldn't have closed. My lawyer was buddy buddy with the with the lawyer of the condo association. Told me I had to close, yeah. so I closed on a house or a condo that didn't have vanity tops bathroom faucets um, told me that's legal you got a punch list I'm not a, I'm not Was a it new brand new brand new I'm not a dummy uh, I've been in the construction business 
good part of my life, and I know you can't get an occupancy permit without bathroom uh, <coughs> fixtures. Yeah. But the whole thing the lawyer was saying was that the stipulation in the in the contract is you'll close when uh, when they have an occupancy permit. They have one. I said, how did he get an occupancy permit without faucets? Not only their lawyer, but my lawyer just looked at me and said, he's got an occupancy permit. So you got to close? So I closed, yeah. I mean, to this day, he said, he said well, you, you just make out a punch list and we come by and, you know, that, that's common on new, on new construction. Yeah. That was two and a half months ago. I haven't seen anybody to do my punch list yet. I really, really want to get well, That was not touch. a bold move, real estate no, agent, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> what? To see if you can scroll. Okay. But an attorney supersedes what your agent tells you to do, yeah. so that's on the attorney. And that's and, and this is one of the challenging things about real estate agents is, is that, you know, before when I told you, like, the Massachusetts, like, it's a blanket over uh, general, you know, like, the, 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 the state is over the, the, the um, general or whatever. What Paula just said is, is that for us, when an attorney's involved, the attorney is the blanket over us. So, for example, if we're saying, and a lot of times we're advocating for our, our clients, and we're saying, and I don't know that your realtor did this, it doesn't sound like they, he or she did, but um, saying, no, you know, we need, he needs a sink. And then the lawyer's going, you know, no, it's fine, and then whatever, they get, they're getting to it, like, you know, almost like, don't be so naive, you know, or whatever. And so, a lot of times, it's, it's challenging that way. Did you, did you have your own buyer's agent? my mother. Oh. oh, well. There was not. It had nothing to do with her. Yeah, it had nothing to do with Well, again, when they turned... It really didn't have anything to do with the realtors. Oh, that's right. Your mother's Julia, right? Yeah. Definitely was not Julia's no, fault. No. Because she's a great she's a great realtor, you know? So a lot of times that's a challenge, you know, but it, it, but it makes everybody look bad, you know? So one of the things we strive to do is make sure that we make the experiences that we can as positive as possible, okay? Um, Okay, so we just talked about these different things um, and we read through these rules, so here we go, we're right on track. Okay, so the purpose of licensing laws is to establish basic requirements for licensees, define which activities require licensing, just, oh, you put these, did you yeah. describe standards of conduct and practice for licensees, and enforce standards throughout the disciplinary system. Okay, a real estate broker is licensed to buy, sell, exchange, or lease real property for others and to charge a fee for those services. So that's the definition of the broker, okay? And, and for the brokers who are here, that is, this is something that is a question. Um, the relationship of the broker and salesperson. Okay, real estate salesperson is licensed to perform real estate activities on behalf of a licensed real estate broker. Okay, so again, any time that a licensed salesperson is speaking or acting, you are speaking or acting for your broker. Okay, so you have that broker sitting on your shoulder. Okay, you're speaking as if you're that broker. Okay, you know, and there's times that I've said, would I say that? And someone says, well, no. I said, then please don't say that. Because ultimately, the bottom line comes that it's the broker. The broker's the person with the liability. The broker's the person who would be punished. <laughs> so, um, and it's also the reputation of the brokerage. You know, um, the broker for whom the salesperson works is called the employing broker. Again, we are not employers, so I don't, I don't really like the fact that they call it the employing broker. Um, we were just at, a, at that, that, that thing that we went to today. They talked about that case I talked to you about where, um, where it's Modell versus Hot Pads, where um, they were saying that, trying to clarify once again that real estate agents are not employees and real estate brokerages are not employers per se, but we're independent contractors and we are contracting you for a job. Okay, and the subject to the, and, and both will be subject to the terms of an employment agreement, even when the salesperson is an independent contractor for tax and other purposes. So every time that you start with a, a real estate company, they will do an independent contractor agreement with you where things are spelled out, okay? So that will specify how it's going to work, what the responsibilities are. It will also say that, um, I don't, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but if anyone's ever been fired before from a job, um, a lot of times in order to, you know, for the protection of the company that's firing, they often fire with cause. And so they normally, you know, if, if you're a person that they plan on firing, the first time you do something, they, they make a note, you sign on it, they sign on it, you put it in their file. 
you know, and I think it's three times, and then you have grounds to fire to fire them, and then they you know they they can't come back and say that it was unfair or whatever. That is not the case <coughs> with real estate, because you are it's just like as if you were contracted for a service, and if it was a time that came that 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 brokerage did not want to work with you, okay, they don't fire you, all right, you, they just disassociate, okay. It's in the contract says with or without cause. Okay, so they had they could be no cause. You know, whatever it is. I mean, by and large, most 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 brokers would not tell you what the cause was. They, you know, I mean you'd believe me, you'd know, but you know, but they would just say, you know, I'm I'm deciding to disassociate. And then that's when and they break that off. And then that would be how you, you work it through. So um, so it's different. You know, you're not gonna get like if, if if you're supposed to do something and you don't, you're probably not going to get a little note to go into your folder in your file, okay? It's just going to be one of those things that's going to be a deciding factor. Okay, back to the taxes. You don't get taxes taken out of your pay, okay? So you <coughs> would, um, you, it's your 1099, you're 1099, and then you pay your own taxes. And I spoke with you yesterday about um, the things that you are legally able to write off. You know, if you have a good system, and you should have a system from day one, about you know how to track your expenses and what, what you can expend, you know, your tax burden is not normally that high. Um, so, especially at the beginning, because I'd say for the first few years, you're probably, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you can expend, you know. Um, the other thing on that is when you, when you do start to, to, to earn enough that you're not that you're that you that you can't expend everything. You know, there's quarterly taxes that are, are due and then there's some other systems in place. We don't need to talk about that today, it's not on the test. But that's something that I'm telling you as a from business person to business person. Okay, have your business house in order <laughs> before you start doing things. I never did. I was like freaking winging a prayer. Like, you know, I mean I I don't know, that's just not I mean, I wish I did. <laughs> Um, so, an employee rules for working hours, office routines, attendance at meetings, sales quotas, and dress codes. Uh, independent contractor, no employee benefits, set on rules. Okay, so here comes the challenge. You know, when you go and you talk to real estate companies, and here we have a policy manual. Okay, most companies have a policy manual. All companies have policies. Now, our particular company has a policy of coming to the sales meetings on Monday mornings. Okay, it's, it's mandatory unless you don't have unless you have a reason you can't come. Okay, so now my old company, when we did this, there was a couple people that would go like, can't make you come to that meeting. I'm an independent contractor. Right, so first of all, there should be a little flag in your head going like disassociate, right? The second thing is that while it's not a employment rule, it's a policy. And you've agreed to follow the policies of the company. So pick a company that, poli that their policies are in alignment with what you want to do. You know, so, you know, we have up hours that people agree to work if they can. You know, um, when we started our company, we did not have that as a, as a rule, and we're trying to work it in, and, and it's kind of like a little, like, out there. But it's, so you want to try to stay within the alignment of the, of the policies. You know, we have a we cloud, you know, which means that we put our paperwork on cloud and we're paperless. Um, we have, you know, we have the paperless capabilities from wherever you are. Some companies do, some companies don't. So there's, there's ways, you know, your best bet is to find somebody who you feel in alignment with, you know. Um, sales quotas, we don't really have sales quotas. Many companies do. If you don't meet your quota, then you may be disassociated. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things. There are some common themes through it, okay, and then there's some, there's some unusual things. One thing I'm going to offer you is that if you are interviewing with somebody you know a couple people and they talk to you about the policies and you want to run them by me you know call me up you know i'd love to talk with you you know uh and, and help you and guide you okay so there are no employee benefits well this says there's no employee. we don't follow the same your taxes aren't taken out uh there is no health insurance there's although there is through the through the small business and through the, the, the NAR, so that's National Association of Realtors, has an insurance program. So there are kind of benefits, but it's not the same thing. So when, you know, like when I was young, I never ever, ever thought about benefits, you know? And so like to talk to me about benefits, I couldn't give a rat's ass, you know? 
as I get older and all of a sudden I see all these people with benefits and I'm like, darn it, why did I care about benefits? You know, this job does not have benefits. So a lot of times you'll, you'll see like in a, in a marriage, you know, one, one, one of the partners has benefits and the other one can go and, and not have benefits. That, that's one of the things that sometimes gets a little tiring. You know, there's a joke in real estate that says the good news is you never need to retire. You can work on this forever. You know, some of the best people I know are 96 year old realtors. You know, the bad news is you have to work. You can't retire because you, you don't have any retirement benefits. You know, so, um, so it's, it's something that you will think about. You know, today, that's not really going to be a big question. This will be a question. But this is something that's important to think about. Um, broker's compensation. Okay, so compensation is one of those things that people always say, like, explain again how we get paid. Because, right, everybody thinks, like, when they see, like, the settlement statement that there's, like, tons of money, right? And everybody should be making, like, buckets of money. And then you talk to realtors, and they're going, it's not really that much. And they're going, oh, where's it go? So specified in the contract with clients, there's a commission. Sometimes it's called a broker's fee. Um, and so let's talk about that first. And let's see. The best way, again, back to my food. <laughs> We're going to make our pie on what happens to one commission, OK? This is a traditional business model, OK? Which means that if most real estate companies would have a business model similar to this. There are some business models that you'll see that say like you get to keep all your commission, you just pay your fees or whatever. This is just a traditional one, okay? Generally speaking, there's the list side and the buy side. Okay, you'll notice I am not using the word sell because it sell can be used in context on both sides. Like in the MLS, it's the listing agent and the selling agent. Okay, however, when you talk about it to somebody else, this is the seller's agent, this is the buyer's agent. So that sell means two different things. So I just take that word sell right out for our explanations. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the list side and the buy side. So normally there's one commission. Let's just say that commission is $10,000. Okay, and the listing agent gets that 10, that whatever the percentage is, right, whatever the percentage the percentages on it, they get that in the, the listing agreement from the seller. So then they promise on MLS a certain amount to the buy side. Okay? So this seller, through the listing agreement, is going to pay a commission. And the listing agent is going to pay a buyer's agent to bring them a buyer. <clears throat> okay? It all comes from one source. Okay? And I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but this is just in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's just say for argument purposes that it's, all right, let's just say it's a 5% commission. Okay? So a lot of times if you look on MLS, a lot of them promise the buyer side 2.5. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about language. Antitrust, which is the first word I think in your vocabulary, talks about things that we can talk about and things we can't talk about. Okay, um, the Federal Trade Commission is a little irritated by the way that real estate does business because we talk about commissions as like the going rate and 50-50 splits and whatever and they feel like we're trying to uh, price fix. So we have to be very careful in our language, okay? Um, and this has gotten to be a little bit more like Honestly, I would say in the past couple of years is when we really cleaned up our language here. We used to say mutual reciprocal agreement of, you know, 50-50 split and then come to find out that, you know, they really, really do not want you to call it that. So, you pro so in the listing agreement, they promise you an amount. Okay. They also tell you, and this is something that will be on the test, all commissions are negotiable. Okay. So let's just say we had that $10,000 and it's a 50-50 split. Sorry. See, there I go. Two and a half, two and a half. So that would be $5,000 on this side and $5,000 on this side. Okay? So each side is going to get $5,000. So that's the total commission. That goes to the brokerage. Right? The salesperson only gets paid by their broker. Okay? So in every real estate company, there's an agreement 
on how this money is going to be split. Okay. Some companies are a 50 50 split. Some companies are, are more, some companies are less. Um, I'm not going to comment on what most companies are, but let's just say for the fun of it, it's a 50 50 split. Okay. So that $10,000 becomes $5,000 each side, which means $2,500. That was a little tough. $2,500 and $2,500. Okay, so that means that the listing brokerage, the broker, gets $2,500. You, as the listing agent, get $2,500. The buyer's broker gets $2,500. And the buyer's agent gets $2,500. So this is a traditional commission split. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple tips. So if it was a $10,000 commission with a 5% commission, how much did that house cost to sell? $10,000 is 5%. No. $200,000. $200, $200,000, right. So this is a little bit low for this area. Most houses in this area are more than $200,000. Okay? So here's how I figured out. $200,000, right? So the first number in that is a two. So my little quick, <laughs> I'm sure I'm writing myself. My quick mental math would be that if it was 200, I'm gonna round it up and I'm gonna make a little bit more than 200. So I'm gonna make 2,500. If it was a $250,000 house, which we have a lot of, my mental math knows that I'm gonna get about $3,000 for that house. Okay, and that's how I figure it out. So when I'm trying to figure out, when I take a listing, what I'm probably gonna make, I round up, so if it's a four hundred thousand dollar house, I know I'm gonna get about five grand. You know, so that's just my little trick. That's like just really ugly and early. I never, I honestly never know when I get paid until like I get my commission check. You know, um, and actually I don't even know that because I don't know my password into my pay stub. So, um, so any, <laughs> so anyway, this is how the commissions are paid. Okay, this is called the traditional model. Okay, um, and this would be a policy that the company has, right? So where I'm, where you're gonna get a test that says all commissions are negotiable, you're gonna go into your first interview with someone, you're gonna go like, all right, let's talk about my commission because I know it's negotiable. And they're gonna say, no, it's not. <clears throat> and you're gonna say, oh, yes, it is, that's antitrust, you can't have that. And they're gonna say, this is that company policy. Okay, so do you understand how that works? <laughs> are there any questions on that? Well, I, I have a question in that model. Um, are, is that model for your agency? No. Well, this is for a cohort. Yes, this is this is the model for my agency. The numbers are not the same for my agency. My, that is not my split. No, I meant. Um, I am a So you have buyer brokers and, and selling brokers in the same office. Yep. Yes, I do. Yes. So, uh, so she asked if if we have both listing agents and selling agents. We absolutely do. Our, our buyers agents and, and listing agents, um, and we also practice dual agency here. Some of us. Some of us don't like it. But, um, but by and large, uh, we offer dual agency, um, which we'll talk about probably, I think, tomorrow. Um, so that's a really good question. Some companies are like buyers only, and some companies are sellers only. Oftentimes, there are people in, a, in an office who only want to handle sellers, and there are companies that have only want to handle buyers. And also on that, there's a lot of, when you see the teams out there, mm -hmm. a lot of times on a team, like for example, I, my friend Anthony Lamacchia, who you might have heard of, when he, he has his company that when new agents start with him, right, they start as buyer's agents and they get fed their buyer leads through that listing agent and that kind of thing. And then they go and they start there. So they can't take a listing when they start. And then you like graduate to be a listing agent. You know, so, um, so there's different models out there. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. This is something that people always wonder, you know, like how do, how do you get paid? And, like, and then you see a $10,000 paycheck and you get, $3,000 in your pocket, it's, it's, you know, it's, it feels a little anticlimactic sometimes. Okay, procuring costs. Who gets that, who gets that, that commission? All right, so procuring costs is one of the thresholds for who is due that commission on that buy side, okay? And what that means is that who brought, who's responsible for bringing the ready, willing, and able buyer to the closing table. Who's, who did that? Okay, so that is what they call procuring cause. And what there are 
are there are thresholds to that because old the old days it was whoever showed up first now there's open houses and a lot of times people go to open houses without their agents so they the agents may make a relation make an agreement after or whatever but that first time you see it might be what some people say is their procuring cause <coughs> another threshold is who wrote the offer right and this is a little bit more prevalent up in the Boston area where they um, they don't you know the, the, there's not as much emphasis on that first showing because people like 30 and 50 people go to open houses you know but it's when someone brings that offer in okay and then that's their threshold it could be the person who did the pay oh, don't go away it could be the person who did the paperwork um, Kevin? <laughs> you go see if Kevin's there? Yes. Hey, Paul, will you ask, is Kevin still there? Yeah. Will you ask him to come back? Kevin? What if it's a company <coughs> ad? A company ad. Okay, okay, good question. So her question is, okay, and this is a really good question. Different companies have policies. Oh, never mind. You just looking at it made it happen. <laughs> Stand right there. Okay, so, and I'm just going to go back and forth just to keep it going, okay? Um, so... So, so Bold Moves places an ad, and someone calls the office on that ad, right? So there's two ways that a company will handle that. Some companies give all inquiries about that property to the listing agent. Some say, you know what, there needs to be rewards for that person answering that phone on uptime. They get to capture it. So that's one threshold. The other threshold could be, did they ask for the listing agent, or did they not? So you know how a lot of times the listing agent has their name underneath? Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people, as soon as you start and you make your decision, order your name writers. Because you get a listing and you're so excited, I'm like, wait till you put your sign out until you have your name writer. And they're like, no, 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 I'm going to do it right now, I'm going to do it right now, I want to get that sign out. And they put it out, they get a call to the office, they don't get that half. You know, so it has to do with what the company policy is. But those are all thresholds. The, the bottom line is procuring cause is a huge issue in real estate. That all of the, I'm, I'm, I do a lot of arbitration hearings, and almost all of them are about who gets the commission. And so you have to decide, like, who did the, who did, is there, a, is there a buyer agreement on the person? Who did the agency disclosure? Who did this? There's a whole bunch of thresholds that happen with it. So it's not black and white. But I will tell you, as Laura learned, whoever has the money sometimes makes that decision. Because a lot of times, you know, in some situations, you know, there's different answers. Like, we do it one way, they do it another, and so there's, there's discord, you know. And... Uh, and it's even getting more confusing, but for the test, we won't talk about that. The test, what you need to know is the procuring cause brings that ready, willing, and able buyer, okay? And that would be who's entitled to the buyer's side of that fee, okay? All right, sales associate compensation. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the models. I talked to you about the 100% commission plan. So there are companies out there, and I'm going to use Remax as an example because they were kind of the pioneers on this. You know, they were the first company that said, you know, I think it was 95% commission you earned. Um, Keller Williams has a cap where you, you pay into a certain amount and then you get to keep all of your, your compensation. So people have different compensations uh, plans. And they also have like what's included in your, 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 your membership or whatever you're, you're working there and what isn't. Do you have to pay for printing? Do you have to pay for paper? Do you have to pay for business cards? Do you have to pay for you know, your email? Do you have to pay a... So there's a lot of things that go into it. So most of the time, on the 100% commission plans, there's a lot of different added fees that go into it. And so, you know, my general thought is if you're a very high producer, sometimes those 100% fees are better because, you know, however, if you are at a certain, if you're just starting or if you are, uh, you know, whatever, sometimes you don't want to be paying those fees. It's a, it's a, it's a preference. <coughs> I remember when I was going to like a, and I started with Conway, and they, they went, he went to like Conway College of Real Estate Knowledge of course, and I'm sitting there next to this guy from Bridgewater. He goes, oh yeah, I'm gonna get all the training here and I'm going to Remax. And I'm like, huh, why? <laughs> you know, because I didn't get what he was going at. But what he wanted was to get that base under the safe thing of not having to pay anything. And then he wanted to go over to the one that he had to pay, pay for, you know, but he would then be making more money because, you know, so anyways, that's kind of the, the feeling on that. But the models change all the time. Um, no matter how the sales associate's compensation is structured, as a rule, only the employing real estate broker can pay it. Okay, so for salespeople, 
you get paid from one source. And this is on the test, and they'll ask it a lot of different sneaky ways. A, a, a salesperson gets paid by their broker, and only their broker, okay? So no matter how they say that to you, that's the answer. So I was saying this to one of the classes, and the person looks up to me and they go, all right, we get it, you know? And I'm like, no, you don't. You get this question wrong all the time. Because they ask it in a lot of different ways, okay? Um, Fee-for-service is something that is a hybrid of um, real estate brokerages, and we actually, we have a, a menu of services here where rather than giving the full service where it's like the traditional, you can have the option of actually selecting the services that you, in a finite way, and you pay for just those services, okay? Um, when we started the company, when the, the market was tanking, and when we were in a recession, and you know, and it was, a, that was something that was very popular. You know, now we, we get a handful of them. And, um, but you know, they, they pick, like right now, we have home staging that goes with our full service. You know, we actually call it beyond full service, you know, for that. And then we also offer it for a fee for our fee for service. You know, so there's different things like that, okay? Um, that, that 3D video that we do, you know, that is something that's included for your full service, but would be a fee for your fee for service. So you guys get that, right? So you're charging the, what? You're charging the homeowner by being not being real yes. estate agent. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, um, and then requirements vary from <coughs> state to state. Um, okay, so antitrust laws. This is back what I was touching on before. Okay, the, the, the big thing that they do not want is for us to be unfair to the consumer. So the first thing is that price fixing. So the first thing of the, the price fixing is what we talked about, which was, um, actually we didn't talk about this. Price fixing would be that, you know, Price fixing would be that we say, okay, nobody's got to go below this, per this this percent commission, you know, in the area. So you know, no one's going to undercut it so that it doesn't go below it, because a lot of people feel like you know you got like um, there's a company in New Bedford that does a three percent commission, you know, um, and then you get you know house to sell. Remember them? Mm -hmm. You know they had a two percent commission. Now the the thing is, a lot of times those companies are no longer around because it's hard to sustain a business on that kind of compensation. But those are some of the things. And so the, what they said is we can't price fix it. We can't say nobody goes below a 5%. Like I can't call and complain to Sandra Dawson up the street when she does a, you know, when there's a 4% commission there. It's it, like I can't, we can't fix it, you know. And that's, and we also cannot say, you know, the industry, you know, what are some of the ways that we say it? The going rate? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The going rate is 5%. Like you can't say that. A group boycott. That would be okay. So when we started that FIFA service, one of the things that we were very afraid of was that we were going to get boycotted by the other people because it was something that was a little different, and it was something that was it seemed like it was you know an unfair advantage. So it would be illegal for Caldwell Banker and Shinder Dawson to get together and say we're not selling any of their listings. Okay, um, that didn't happen, and maybe we'll talk about that someday when we're talking. But um, allocation of customers. We don't say, you know, in Marion, you know, Converse gets all the waterfront on this side. And um, although interestingly, as I'm looking around the room, um, even though we don't say that, I have heard, like in the Payton Aram area, they are very, like, by the block on who does what listings, you know, just as an unheard thing, you know. And so, like, when someone comes in that's not of their people, you know, they say, oh, well, that's, um, well, I'm not going to say any names, but, or whatever, but they, they just have this unwritten allocation. Okay, so if this is spoken about between, like, if broker to broker actually talked about this, right, that would be antitrust. So sometimes we get cute and we call them apples and oranges, and we say, well, we can't talk about money, but I can talk about apples and oranges. You know, we offer two and a half apples. What do you offer? You know, like, you can't, you know what I mean? Like, and I've, I've, we've actually been to trainings at like on a state level where they say get out of my orchard, and what they're saying is, you, you know, talking because we can't talk money, we have to talk apples. So it's ridiculous because how do you have a conversation about money? And, and and again, if everything's negotiable, how can we not do it? But that is some of the stuff that happens in this. Um, and then tie-in agreements. And I always forget what tie-in agreements is. Who wants to tell me what a tie-in agreement is? Oh, I think I know. 
agreements to sell one product only if the buyer purchases another product as well. Okay, so like an example of a tie-in agreement would be like, um, okay, like um, I will, I will, I, we can sell this property only if you use this mortgage person. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, I remember putting into an offer once again when I was very, very green, like, um, or to the listing agreement that I would represent them on their buying side. You know, if I took the listing, then I would <coughs> represent them on the buy side. So I tied in both of them together, you know, so you can't do that. Um, but basically, it's tying the things together. Any questions on that? Okay. So technology and real estate practice. All right, NAR, Internet Data Exchange, this is IDX policy. Okay, so um, who has their book open to this? What does it say? Um, under technology and real estate practice, it says uh, most real estate agencies have websites that provide access to extraordinary databases for property and other searches. Okay, all right, so what we're talking about here is, has anyone heard the words big data? Okay, big data talks about all of the information that is available online, how it's shared, how it's accessed. And what we have said through this IDX, which is the, which is the um, Internet Data Exchange, is we're all going to put our, our listings into this data exchange or into this multi-listing service of one sort or another, and everybody has access to them. So that book that I told you about that, you know, the, the former realtors used to use that only they had, this internet data exchange changed that so that we all have access. So any buyer's agent can come and go on MLS, see what they're promised for a, a pay, and call that person and ask for a showing, okay? So that's how they opened this up. And it's on websites. So like when you, and you know, when people, like when this first happened, you know, we would say to someone, not only do we list it on this, but we list it on, they would name all these things as if they were actually physically listing it on all of them. You know, I'm not saying like with one click of a button, it goes everywhere, you know. So, um, so that is something that happens with, the, with this. And this is actually when it came time for the, the, the menu of services, this was one of the things that was our determining factor, was they no longer needed us for that old style stuff. So how about we hire, they hire us for what they need us for, you know, and, and, and it made sense, and it still makes sense for some people. Okay, so that's like that was a big change in real estate. Okay, and um, the second big change was the use of smartphones. So, you know, again, the first change on that was that you actually had the ability to do your business from anywhere. Okay, and you actually could pull up a listing on your phone. You could pull up your files on your phone. You know, you had this ability to do that anywhere. The newest thing, as far as this goes, is uh, the apps. That people are, and I was telling you about that the home snap app yesterday is that these apps are changing things and you know the apps are changing things from the way that we can find listings to the information we can find out about the properties to for realtors to how we can they, they now scrub like neighborhoods and who may be ready to sell and they sell the leads and so you know basically everything that all these data points of information that they that they have gathered from people are now getting turned around and, and created into information points, okay, that, that are making our jobs more sophisticated in some mm -hmm. ways, and also, um, you know, very, very, very tied in with technology, okay. But I'm going to keep on going on this while we're on this, on this pack. Well, I'll jump in right now, and I'll just say, so this kind of leaves an opportunity for, for you guys to say, well, that's what is happening that's what people seem to want but what do most people want what did he want he wanted someone to help him out of that mess he wanted someone to be there to be able to figure that out you know they don't they don't want you know I remember there was <laughs> I have a review on my on my website of this like I don't know 80 year old lady who was moving out of town right and she wanted me to come in and sit at her kitchen table with her all the time of course I am IDX and smartphone and social media and internet advertising and I am like I don't want to I don't even want to like stop my kind of letter out you know what I mean <laughs> so anyways so I brought it to the closing right and she's an 80 year old lady I brought it because she couldn't drive all the way to Plymouth you know and I didn't know this then but I found out on the way home 
like she white knuckled the whole way there because I was talking on my phone and blah 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 and you know I was just you know like not the whole time but like you know I always use the excuse like I have to have my phone on because I have kids you know and so I'm like well yeah of course I have to go there so so anyways I brought her there and at one point she said you know you are you are killing me with the way that you are driving <laughs> and I'm like really right so her review about me and it's not, and I leave it on my on my on my my list of reviews because I think it's important for people to see that I put the, the bad up with the good, but it's also a lesson to me to remember. She said, Kate can't help that she talks really fast. But, you know, she hurries through this, she's on her phone when she's driving, blah, blah, blah. You know, so she says all these things, which I stopped making her feel important because of all these things that I thought I was doing really well for her. You know, so it's important that we keep that opportunity to, to touch that person, you know. And, I'm, and, I, I'm, and I say this especially to young people, because your generation, you don't think really want to talk to you. They don't call you or text you or whatever until they're 70% made up on the decision of what they want to do, right? And then they want this other stuff. But the rest of the people, they're not so sure. You know, we have a thing in, at Bold Moves where we say, treat people the way that they want to be treated, you know? And so, but my thing is, treat them the way they want to be treated unless they don't want you to do anything. <laughs> Because you need to do it. Like, you need to touch them. You need to reach out. So, anyways, I'm going to get back over here. Technology has been a game changer for our business. You know, for me, it's been a lifesaver. Because I could not, I, you know, I think I was saying, like, the last time I think when I sat down at my desk to clean it so people could sit there over this thing, like, there was stuff there since August. You know, so I have not sat at my desk since August. You know, so it's been a game changer for me. However, I have to remember that technology is not my whole job okay email and texting do they want to email do they want to text when do you email when do you text you know can I just give you a couple caveats about this okay if you are emailing I say email because I want I want to have a paper trail I want every agent in here when they have a problem to be able to show me the paper trail however what I don't want to see and what you might want to consider is like when you have like a sentence that you write and then a half a page of your signature you know, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too, and I have to go back and every time I do it, like, all of my websites, this and that, and it's like this long. You know, that's irritating. You know, where you, you know, so clean that up a little bit. Make sure that you set your settings so that it only goes out like the first time you're sending it, and then after there, it's, 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 it's like abbreviated or whatever. There's a setting right on your emails that you can do it. Like, don't, you know, make it like not annoying, you know, and make it personal and, you know, make it a connection, but you don't have to have everything there, you know. Um, and some people like when they have the pictures and the this and the whatever, it gets too much. So texting. Texting is great, but what are the two things that email and text can't do? Someone. Thank you. Who said that? You get a prize. I wish I had prizes. <laughs> Sonia, will you have me with prizes to borrow? Because because you can't tell you can't tell a tone. I just had someone and it it was a an, a client who was I, I finished up because it was somebody who was not happy with another person and and so I finished up for this person and so she sent me something to the effect of you know I really want to pay you for that because I you know I don't you know I don't, I don't want you thinking I'm slacking or something you know and I said you know no um, you know it's, it's really yeah, it's all like you know I feel happy to do this because I want you to be happy so she thought I was being fresh so she got upset and I'm like no 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 I'm sincere in that. Like I, I, I really want you to be happy, but rather than get into this thing where she can't understand my tone and what did she really mean and whatever, pick up the phone and ask. And I'm going to tell you right now, do not negotiate, okay, without talking. You can, what I, what the best thing to do is say, call the person. Now, you as realtors are able to actually, and this is something that's never done anymore, but it's a very effective thing of doing is actually going and presenting the offer that you're going to have to the consumer, to the seller. You have that right to do that. We don't do that anymore. We scan it over, we email it, we call the, we actually don't even feel like talking to the other realtor. So we text them and say, get an offer coming. Okay. Now, if you picked up the phone and you told them the story of your buyer and why your buyer's offer was what it was and how excited they were about the house and how much they loved the colors or whatever, you pick something that it's a five minute phone call, but it matters so much. And then if you have a person who wants to counter offer low and you send it, then again, the person doesn't understand tone, they don't understand intent, whereas a phone call could do it. 
What I say is have that phone conversation, follow up with email so you have your train, right? So that you have that. But again, you cannot do this job. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Sign is the best. She's giving out prizes. Okay, right over here. Well, yeah, give this. Oh, I got a souvenir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I wanted a ruler and a bottle. Do you want to come up? Yeah, I do. I do. It's those, those are the pencils right here, too. They're both loose. So, and now I have some yeah. prizes. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, marketing and, girl. <laughs> so what? The marketing girl knows she is. She does. She does. So, email and texting, social... Okay, I, I just want to go dark. I'm going to just change it and come back. Um, so, email and texting. So some of the other things about this is all of these things that you do have to be in compliance with advertising laws, okay? So it's gonna say social media and internet advertising. So on social media, you know, okay, so if we're supposed to, on advertising, have your company name, your company phone number, your company address or website, and, and also like who you are and your role in it. So again, back to that like mega long signature or when you're on, on Facebook and you're supposed to write all that stuff when you're sending something out. Like, it's like, how do I stay in compliance and not look like an idiot, you know? So um, the basic rule of thumb is it has to be like one click away. So in your bio, you know, you would have where you work, what the number is and all that kind of thing. So they can click right over and find it, okay? So at the beginning when this happened, no one knew. So they're like, so do we have to, every time I, on Facebook that I'm putting something about my job, I have to put my company name there, my company logo, my company there. So no, it has to be one click away, okay? And also, with emailing, you know, I'm gonna urge you to have the most professional email address you can because it's just so much more professional and every company will offer it for you, okay? Some people think, ah, that's overkill, you know, good is good enough. I'm not gonna go there because it's a sore spot with me um, or it's, it's a, a thing that I like, but I, I just feel like how I do things, how I say things is good, better, best. Right? Why not be best? If it's all the same and it takes the same kind of effort, why not be best? Are you um, supposed to have a separate business email? Well, here's the thing. Most companies will give you an email address, okay? And so here's the trick is they give you a company email address. If you leave that company, they keep that email. So a lot of people want to kind of... Um, they, they, they're not sure what they want to do. They want to try to do stuff through their own thing. So remember I started saying like the sexy dimples XOXO? That literally was somebody's email address that came to, for a job offer here. I mean, job opportunity. And I'm like, and she's a great realtor. Honestly, I wish I hired her. But anyways, um, but so, so you have that thing, you know, and some people kind of tie it in, but they make it so that they would be able to keep their, their, their information. Who owns the information is always that tricky thing. Because technically when you do that independent contractor agreement, you're saying your company owns it. However, you'll be damned if you want to give it up. You know what I mean? So there's that tricky little piece there. We'll talk about that again. That's not going to be on the test. But what will be is you have to represent your company and what you say. Okay? What I suggest, and like, for example, some of the people, like Russ in here has his own email. I mean, his own, actually, everybody in here, all of the people, all the people, all my guys in the back that are joining us, all have their own websites. So they can do, like, Paula is Paula at PaulaTosca.com, you know? And Laura's Laura at LauraSeverino.com. I, I think actually she has that email. So, so you, they all have that. So that way it's professional and it's personal and it's personal branding, but you can also follow the compliance laws. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that you should try to be the best you can. Um, internet advertising follows the same guidelines and and uh, that regular advertising does. Okay, so sometimes they're like, well, again, just follow that one click away thing. But the rule. The question that's going to be on your test is that it follows the same guidelines, okay? Electronic contracting. Okay, so several years ago, they started doing uh, e-signing, where you could do the DocuSign, um, e-signing, where you, you send it and you pick it, your signature, or you can write your signature. Some of the apps have you like do your little finger signature or whatever, and they are saying that they, it, is, it is valid contracts. Okay, so the, 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 they call them dry signatures. So lawyers will ask you for a wet signature, which is actual wet ink, if you will, a lot of times, or a mortgage company sometimes. But it's basically legal to do an e-sign, and it's um, and it's and so it's we'll see how this plays out in courts. But like Carla, that girl just came in, she's like, my guy's away, and blah blah blah. So she's doing an e-sign, she's sending it over. The beautiful thing is that when you use e-signing, 
like your contract from start to finish takes about five minutes because everybody just signs on it and it's, and it's email transmitted and it's, you know, and it's done. Whereas otherwise you are like getting in your car, you're driving it over to the next place, they're getting in their car, they're driving it with the signatures, they're driving it back. They're... So, oops, there's a change. Get back in your car, drive it around again. So you're saving a lot of times like that. So it's a lot more efficient, okay? So for our time being now, they are legally binding 100%, okay? Oh. Yeah, so I think that's gonna be challenged. But it's never been challenged in court, any. It's been challenged in different things, but so far, so so far, there has not been any challenges that have that have negated this. So, for your test, it is legally binding. Okay, so this is a way that you can sign. Sonia. Uh, foreclosures most do not take the signature. Okay, good to know. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, we just hit the one in Rhode Island. They would not accept our e-signatures. We have to everything. Um, yeah, we could scan an email, which kind of didn't make any sense to me because it's still not a fresh, you know, ink. But we still could scan an email, but we could not do e-signatures. Which is interesting. So maybe there's a movement at this stage of the game. Or maybe that's Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And it might be Rhode Island. It might be, it might be the different, again, back to what I was telling you before about policies versus laws. You know, people can have their own policies, you know, and if you are working with them, you know, then you have to follow their policies. There's different companies that, you know, you have to do everything on the computer, whatever, on the computer. Um, okay, prohibited communications. Okay, so the first on this is the National Do Not Call Registry. So this is kind of a joke now because, like, I mean, whoever even answers the home phone anymore because it's always people calling you. It's all junk callers, I, you know. I mean, so there's a registry that you many people signed up for, and it says that you cannot call them. So what happened for our industry is we we stopped. Literally, what happened in our industry is we just stopped calling people. You know what I mean? We stopped prospecting that way because we're like, oh no, they might be on the Do Not Call registry. And by nature, we all hate to call people anyways. I call it the 500 pound phone, you know, so we just stopped. However, the go-getters out there said, you know what, I'm gonna ask for forgiveness, not permission, and I'm just gonna do it, you know. But the gist of it is, the law of it is, you can't call people on the do not call registry. Um, there's a, you can find out their names on it. Um, people have to renew on the do not call registry, so there's a whole big thing. Now it's time that those first people that signed on it, if they didn't renew, they're now open game. You know, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you on that. Um, tel Telephone Consumer Protection Act, that means that you cannot, I think that means that you cannot harass people on the phone. Is that right? If they tell you not to call and if, they, if you're harassing them. You know, I remember like bill collectors coming to my parents' doors and like totally harassing them. I don't think you can do that anymore. Is that what that is? Yeah, basically. Okay. Junk Facts <coughs> Prevention Act. Okay, so. You technically, unless you have permission to be faxing to someone, you're not supposed to fax to them, okay? Um, which is kind of funny, because no one faxes anything anymore. So, I mean, it's, what were we talking about? Were you talking the story about trying to get a fax into a machine, into an office? Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, that was. Fighting to get a fax machine into the office. Like, the, the owner did not want one of those new age things into the office. We don't have a fax machine here. You know, um, we have a fax number that we accept faxes, but we do everything through email. And why do we do that? Okay. Proof, we want proof that we sent it. So um, we want to have that, that, that trail. Controlling the assault of non-solicited -solic pornography and marketing act of 2003, can spam act. So what this has turned into is permission to email somebody, okay? And uh, permission to have them on your list of people that you're emailing, okay? and. Um, some of it's implied consent, some of it's expressed consent. Um, every email that you send, like if, it, if you're not sure, there generally is a can spam um, unsubscribe on it. You know, if you, yeah, you're getting this email because, you, you know, sometimes you see, some people put the, the, the disclaimer right on top, some have it on the bottom. If you send an email, especially in a group email to somebody that you don't have permission to send it to, you are spamming them, okay? So that's against the law. You know, again, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you, I think is a lot less done now. However, who's been spammed with it? So here's the other part about the, the, the scam thing, is when you send a group email out, and you send like, and you write all of them in like the two thing, right? So all of those, those people who are trying to find spammers and their names, that's where they find you. So um, there's this thing called 
blind CC or BCC where you send it to yourself and you put everybody else in BCC and nobody can get their email addresses. And that's essentially what Constant Contact and Bomb Bomb are doing. They're BCCing all those people just in a really pretty way, right? So, um, so anyways, that, that's something that's been, I mean, I cringe every time I get something like that because I'll tell you a story about what I did. <laughs> Again, I learned everything the hard way, right? So my, my daughter, maybe, or my son went to junior high school and they sent all the parents an email, the two, right, the two, all the parents got an email. And I was just getting into real estate. I was just hitting my stride, you know? I'm like, awesome. That's like 500 people I can add to my, my mailing list. And I copied them all, and I pasted them for my next newsletter. You know, <laughs> people are like, who is this? Where did you find my name? You know, because now I don't even tell them all because I realized that I was making a mistake, you know? But here came the point, like once I knew I was spamming them, and I'm not going to tell you the answer to this, did I take them off my list or didn't I? You know, if they didn't care and they let me do it, did I take them off? I don't know, I'm not telling you. Um, could be, couldn't be, you know, anyways. That, that was against the law, you know, and that was a really obnoxious thing to do, you know, and so that was like the most part of it, you know. And also, if you are sending out a, like a, your, your, like your e-newsletter that you're sending to people, and you take your whole entire contact book, and you say, well, I have the email. I mean, obviously, I'm allowed to email them. I have their email address. We've emailed before. Well, they did not give you permission to send them that. You know, so I've had a couple times over the years, like, I've, do I've done that too. You know, and like, you know, an old seller I had said, who is this? Why are you selling me this? I, I live in, you know, Arkansas now. Like, take me off your list, you know. That's all they said. They didn't say like you bitch or anything, right? <laughs> but, um, so, anyways, that's the can spam act, and you know, it's it's why people hate emails, right? And and getting like I I over the over Christmas I got spammed, and Google shut down my account, my email account, because I I think I spammed probably everybody in this room. So um, so that many people got screwed up from it, and it took like like three weeks for it to get picked up and fixed, and so. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a pain in the neck. Uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. I don't know what that is. What is that? I'm I'm guessing that means. Who is it? Restrictions on okay. Can't, okay, from I have a, I have another good story about what I did to violate this. <laughs> Okay, so just going down the line. I know. I'm just you're just telling it all. So I um, at Hastings Junior High, I had done a ton of career days at you know Mariah School and the Kids School, and you know I'd always send out like a, of course I'm big on the, the thank you notes and the gratitude marketing. So I always sent out like a, a note around like for everyone to give me their addresses, so I could send them all a thank you note for coming to my class, right? Which is fine when people trust you, you know. Why well, don't to Hastings? And I didn't, and I said the same thing, I sent it around so that I could, I could get their address and just send them a thank you note. Well, I got a call from like the principal, like, why were you collecting their addresses? I'm like, what? So I'm sending them a thank you note, why? Like, you know, and then like this mother who had like social, uh, social services and whatever at her house, she's yelling at me on this phone and, and I'm like literally going, okay, it's destroyed. Like, you know, I didn't know, but I, I violated that too, because I was like trying to figure this out. So. You gotta be really, and again, she said, you don't understand, you know, like how this works. And I didn't, I was, I was naive on that one. I was isolated, you know? So I don't think like that, you know? So you have to really kind of think about what these protections are. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so key points on this, you're going to read through the key point review, uh, read the quizzes and answers, are you right or wrong and why? Go to the quiz bank and customize the quiz in this unit, selecting the boxes on the bottom to show progress as you go. Take your quiz. How did you guys find those quiz bank questions? Did you find them good? Or did you find them easy? Did you find them? Simple, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were easy. Those were easy? Yeah. yeah. Um, there are different questions. It's not so, we've been using a lot of the same questions from here. So the quiz bank has a lot more questions than that. They really do. It's not the same ones that are in the book. Although we probably took the first ones that were there, so that's what you got. Um, but anyways, let me know. All right, so uh, so let's do a couple quest questions. Again, you have them right in front of you, so let's do a couple. Which statement best explains a sentence? To recover a commission for brokerage services, 
A broker must be employed as the agent of the client. A, the broker must work in a real estate office. B, the client must make an express of implied agreement to, the, to pay a commission to the broker. Okay, there's a word missing there somewhere. The broker must express an interest in representing the client. The broker must have a salesperson employed in the office. To recover a commission for the brokerage services, a broker must be employed as the agent of the client. You say as well? B. A? No, B. B. B, we good on B? Yeah. The client must come to B, yep. The client must make an express or implied agreement to pay the commission to the broker. Okay, so that's a... Wait a minute, let me read the question again. Okay, so that should be or right there, that's all. Um, I'll fix it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry to beat you to it. Let's see, it's a race is on. This word should be or. Okay, um, <laughs> um, just so you know, one of the contract forms is a listing agreement does not need to be in writing, okay? That's like one of the only forms that you will have, one of the agreements that does not have to be in writing, okay? A listing agreement. I mean, your policy, I'm sure, of your company will be that it does have to be, but, but law does not say it in Massachusetts. Okay, a broker would have the right to dictate which of the following to an independent contractor. Number of hours the person would have to work, work schedule the person would have to follow, sales meetings the person would need to attend, uh, conduct and compliance with statutory law and regulations. D. D, right? D. These ones would be policies, okay? For you, you would still probably have to do what you could in order to stay associated, right? But um, they can't make you. What are you guys laughing at back there? Okay. Or, yep. A real estate broker was responsible for the chain of events that resulted in the sale of a client's property. This is called pro forma, procuring cause, <laughs> private offering, proper offer. B. B, procuring cause, right. All right, let's do one more. Right, procuring cause would be that, that, they call it a chain of events, by the way, okay? Which is something that may come up in one of the questions. And what happens, what I was telling you before about that person who showed the property the first time, and why, like somebody may say that person did not be the person who's the procuring cause, they might have broken that chain of procurement by like abandoning that client and stuff like that, okay? All right, I'm gonna do one more question, then we're gonna move on. A real estate asso sales associate classified by the IRS as an independent contractor receives a monthly salary or hourly wage, company provided health insurance, a company provided automobile, a negotiated share of commissions or transactions. E. 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 